Welcome, welcome to this uh, keynote at CHPC, this special session in which we have uh, Dr. Kate Katie uh, as our uh, keynote. Uh, my name is Michaela Taufer. I'm a professor in South Tennessee, Knoxville, and I will be chairing this session. And I have the pleasure to introduce Kate uh, Keithy uh, to for as our keynote today, and it is an honor because uh, Kate is a friend and a fantastic colleague. Uh, she is also the pioneer of infrastructure cloud computing. So we are very fortunate to have you here, Kate. You have been one of the creator of Nimbus project that has been so impactful uh, to define the forced open access infrastructure as a service for the community. And uh, in this talk and recently in your uh, Research, uh, you are leading the Chameleon projects. Uh, we are really excited to learn more about this project because it is such a valuable tool providing deep recognition, large scale, and open uh, exploratory platform uh, for computer scientists and scientists in general. Um, you have uh, quite a lot of achievement in your life. Uh, one of them that I think is very important is you are co editor-in-chief of uh, the Software X uh, journal. Uh, we know today that software play an important role in our community. And with your initiative, you are making software for citizen, uh, uh, for us and for uh, the scientists. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, something about your affiliation before I give you the opportunity to present your work. You are a scientist at Argonne National Laboratory and a senior fellow at the Computational Institute at the University of Chicago. Thank you so much, Kate, for accepting our invitation, and we are looking forward to uh, your talk. One small reminder to our attendees, please write your question in the interface, and I will serve as a proxy for you and ask your question to Kate at the end of this talk. Kate, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction and thank you for um, inviting me. And many special thanks for, uh, to everybody for agreeing to, to move the time slot of the stock to a little bit later in the day. I'm sure it's going to be much better than if I had been talking at, at 2 a.m. my time. Um, but anyhow, so to start with the, um, with the presentation, um, what I'm going to talk to you today is essentially a scientific instrument, right? That's a, it's infrastructure, as Michaela said, called Chameleon, um, because it's, it's very changeable. It adapts itself to people's experimental needs, right? And <clears throat> it's going to be a talk about the evolution of that, uh, of that instrument to meet the emergent goals of, of computer science research. And just uh, by way of acknowledgement, um, at the beginning, I want to say, uh, this is infrastructure led by the University of Chicago. I'm of course a scientist at, at University of Chicago. Um, and it's uh, the co-PIs are from Texas Advanced Computing Center, which I understand many people here collaborate with. Dan Stanzion is the, the co-PI, um, Renzi, and, and Northwestern University um, as well. So um, jumping into uh, the, the subject matter of the presentation, um, scientific instruments. Um, most of us, when we talk about scientific instruments, we envision something like a, a microscope or a telescope. Um, but scientific instrument for computer science research, now what would that look like, right? So computer scientists, of course, what research do they do? Well, they invent new operating systems. They, they define new hardware and, and new characteristics of the hardware. Um, they work on, on resource management or resource allocation algorithms, invent new networking protocol uh, protocols and, and so on and so forth, right? So in order to get an instrument, a scientific instrument that allows them to deploy um, uh, observe and measure relevant phenomena, they need typically some sort of infrastructure platform um, as innovative as possible, right? As bleeding edge as possible. And one that they could reconfigure at a very deep level, right? So um, um, inventing a new operating system, for example, you can't do that by sending jobs to a batch scheduler, right? You have to have a machine where you have root, preferably can reconfigure the firmware, 
um, boot from custom kernel uh, because of course you're implementing that custom kernel, uh, get access to uh, serial console and so on and so forth. But there is one characteristic of all scientific instruments, right? Whether they are for computer science or, or other scientific domains um, that I wanted to call out right up front, which is that they're constantly evolving. Uh, this is because the science, the scientific frontier is, is constantly evolving, it's constantly in motion, right? So you can see that the microscope of yesteryear are not the same as the microscopes that we use today, right? And the telescopes of, of several centuries ago are not the same as telescope arrays of today, right? And some of those instruments are of course very large, right? They, they're composed of millions and sometimes billions of sensors wired together, right? Large hardware and collider, um, uh, various tokamaks and, and other instruments like that. So with that in mind, um, what are the new emergent opportunities in, in uh, science and how can we take an instrument that already exists and evolve it and adapt it in order to serve those needs? And of course, one of those uh, emergent scientific director, uh, directions is, is the proliferation of Internet of Things today. Right? So we have now people invented those um, devices that are very capable, but can be produced very cheaply. They use relatively little energy and we can use them to instrument our whole environment, right? our cities and our forests and our fields. Um, to reason about them, gather information and reason about them. And that ultimately might allow us to instrument the whole planet and build an instrument on an extremely large scale that exceeds the instruments that you've seen on the previous slide, right? You're going to have billions of, of little sensors that are not hardwired, but they are connected by a, a much more adaptable fabric called software, right? And so now, how will an instrument like that be built, right? And I think, I hope I don't need to convince anybody that understanding our environment better could help us solve many problems that we're grappling with today, right? Could help us understand um, uh, population movements, it help us solve various environmental problems, get better insight into um, phenomena like global warming, understand evolution of our cities better and understand what our use of the land does do it, right? So before we do that, however, there's a bunch of problems that we need to address, right? If you think, if you think of building an instrument like that as a goal, right? Then we have to think about how those different sensors, those Internet of Things sensors are connected. Um, how are we going to deal with those expanded scales, which are eventually going to be much greater than what we have in any specific data center, right? How do we address the security issues, the dynamicity of the whole system? How do we provide resilience and so on and so forth, right? So there are many, many open questions that we need to investigate to reach this shining star. And of course, I can't tell you what the answers to those questions will be and what the solutions will be, right? But what I can tell you uh, about today is how uh, you can answer those questions with the help of a very small reptile called chameleon, right? So uh, a few words about what chameleon is today, and then we'll move on to how we're trying to evolve it to help you address those questions. So first of all, I already alluded to that chameleons love to change, right? So we have a test bed that provides the adaptability, the reconfigurability needed for scientific, um, uh, for computer science experiments in particular, right? So you can, you get resources that you can power on, power off. You can reboot it on bare metal level. It really is like having a, a a resource, a node uh, in your lab and close to you where you have administrative privileges on it, right? So you can boot from custom kernel, you get access to all those things that I mentioned before. Now, most of Chameleon is reconfigurable in this way at bare metal level, but we do have a, a part of Chameleon that is set aside that is reconfigurable via um, deploying virtual machines, KVM virtual machines, right? Um, and this is because that allows us to make more efficient usage of resources. And some projects, in particular educational projects, don't really need bare metal reconfigurability, right? And some research projects don't need bare metal reconfigurability too, right? So this allows us to explore a different cost isolation uh, trade-off. 
Now, of course, to address all those, all those research questions we were talking about, uh, you need something that supports experimentation at relatively large scale or as large scale as we can afford for an instrument of this type. And you need hardware that is also diverse, right? Spans the various different needs of, of different communities. So Chameleon provides uh, both, right? It strikes a balance between investment in large scale, a partition with many thousands of cores, uh, and we've got six petabytes of, of storage, roughly speaking. Part of it is distributed among the nodes in various interesting configurations so that people can experiment with storage hierarchies and things like that. But part of it, about uh, 3.5 uh, petabyte attack, is simply global store for, for the system, right? So you can, if you're experimenting with big data, for example, you can store it there. And then most of the hardware uh, right now is at University of Chicago and at TAC. The, our University of Chicago hardware is actually in ALCF, which is the <clears throat> Argon uh, machine room, right? Where we're building the next generation supercomputer, right? So it's distributed over two supercomputing centers connected with 1G network, so you can experiment with large flows as well. And then, of course, it is diverse, right? So we've got arms, atoms, uh, we've got FPGAs, uh, different types at this point. We've got multiple different generations of GPUs, so you can compare uh, how different algorithms interact with different hardware. And we've got interesting networking hardware, CORSA switches, which give you programmable switches, so you can experiment with SDN and, and things like that. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to briefly state it now, we managed to package uh, the system that, that reconfigures, that provides all these capabilities, um, and we call it Chinabox. Chi stands for Chameleon Infrastructure. And now there are other sites, including supercomputing centers that are deploying it, right? So we've got one Chinabox site at Northwestern. Um, NCAR recently chose to contribute some of the new ARM nodes, Thunder nodes to Chameleon. That site will be available in January. Um, uh, IIT, so Illinois Institute of Technology, and uh, um, UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, are also configuring um, sites, and we're talking to other institutions as well. Now, this China box, this, this or this Qi uh, Chameleon infrastructure, uh, what does it look like? Well, so Chameleon was one of the first projects, or, or I should say the first project that based that type of infrastructure, that type of infrastructure, meaning infrastructure for experimental computing on a mainstream system called OpenStack, right? Many of you may be familiar with OpenStack as something that deploys and manages virtual machines and it's a, it's a virtualized cloud, but it turns out it also has component um, that does bare metal reconfiguration. So it doesn't just deploy virtual machines, also manages machines at bare metal. Um, and uh, we built Chameleon on top of that OpenStack, right? So now um, it's OpenStack with many, many services, many of which we contributed to OpenStack. This is about 50-50 split of what we have done there. And of course, building on, on mainstream infrastructures, I'm sure many people here realize has many benefits. First of all, it's familiar to users and operators, so it's considerable time savings there as, as people can uh, get started on the resource much faster, right? Because not only it's the case that many of them are familiar with OpenStack itself, but many of them are familiar with the cloud paradigm, right? And, and things like cloud in it and, um, you know, all the little things that uh, cloud computing relies on. Um, we're, of course, leveraging the contributions of development community that numbers in thousands, so it's cheaper for us to develop and maintain. But of course, we're also contributing to that community, and I'll allude to that later in, in the talk. Um, and that means that that increases our broader impact. And last but not least, there are many mainstream tools that, for example, convert between OpenStack and commercial clouds, right? So it makes it easier for our users to run experiments that are widely distributed over both Chameleon and commercial cloud resources. And then last but not least, um, one thing that we're also investing in and, and that I will describe uh, briefly at the end is we providing uh, mechanisms for our community to share their research, right? To share their research in an interactive way. So not just by writing papers and reading papers, but actually repeating somebody's experiment, interacting with it, introducing controlled variation. And 
To enable that, we provide integration with Jupyter, which is a fabulous vehicle for, for packaging uh, experiments. Uh, we provide ways of accessing Chameleon on an ephemeral basis, so you can be reading a paper and click on a graph that, that catches your fancy and redo the data analysis in that graph or rerun the whole experiment. Um, and then we've got uh, something called Trovi, which is kind of like, like a, um, you know, you can, it allows you to create a, 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 an equivalent of a Google Drive where you can put all the data and things really relevant to experiment. And then it's also integrated with Zenodo, which is a fantastic digital publishing platform invented at CERN. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a roadmap for what's going to happen. Talk, let me uh, dive into details. Uh, before that, though, uh, here's sort of chameleon in numbers, right, to give you an idea of the scale. So we've been in existence since um, 2014, or actually 2015, 2014 is when we got funded over this time. So since then, we um, have had the honor of serving over 6,000 users um, working on uh, more than 750 research and education projects. Education projects are about 11 to 13%, sort of fluctuates over time, 11 to 13% uh, of the projects that we serve. And they published um, more than 450 papers, right? So um, rough statistics to give you an idea of the scale. All right, so as far as Chameleon hardware, so we started out, we first built Chameleon with an investment in um, 12 racks, 12 racks of Intel Haswells, each rack uh, a little bit less than 50, 50 nodes, uh, two different configurations. 10 of those racks were TAC2 at University of Chicago. TAC also had this uh, large global store system that I mentioned. And, uh, and then we started throughout phase, phase one, phase two of Chameleon, started investing in diversity. So you've got uh, non-volatile memory, uh, you know, InfiniBand, the different FPGAs, different GPUs, um, different types of architectures that emphasize different trade-offs. And then in phase two, Chameleon phase two got funded in, in, in roughly 2017. We added a, a couple of Intel Skylake cracks at University of Chicago with uh, Corsa switches. Uh, we added one of those at TAC um, and then moved recently, uh, just last year, to Cascade Lakes. Um, and, and then we just got renewed till the end of... Um, of 2023 um, and uh, 2024 rather, and we're adding even more hardware, right? So just, just last month at University of Chicago, we announced um, three more racks of um, mixed uh, uh, Cascade Lakes um, and, and other architectures that have obtained memories, uh, that have the newest InfiniBand, uh, a range of SSDs and so on and so forth, right? So this now, is getting connected to commercial clouds via an NSF-funded initiative called CloudLine, which allows you to access them seamlessly. Chameleon associate sites I was talking about earlier at Northwestern and others. Um, Fabric, which is a networking testbed uh, in the United States um, and various other partners. And this is just a fly-by slide that, that essentially writes down the detail that, that I was just talking about. So now, how is this whole thing reconfigured? Well, if you think about the, the typical uh, experimental cycle, you know, you come up with hypothesis, let's say you're developing a new machine learning algorithm to discover resources, so you're going to need GPUs, somehow gain temporary ownership of those resources, so allocate them, and then you configure them um, and run your, your experiment and monitor it. So for discovering resources, we have a description of resources that's very fine-grained, that's complete, um, and it's up to date. So it's, it's automated. Every time we add or change the resources, just run some scripts, right? Because if you just provide a, a description of that on the website, it frequently gets out of date. We can't afford that because our users rely on being able to repeat their experiments, right? So this is why we also version the test bed. So you can come to the test bed if your experiment somehow, you know, you're using the same node, doesn't repeat quite exactly, you can check the version, maybe we upgraded memory or added or changed the disk or, you know, and, and uh, experimental components that are sensitive to variability might behave differently. Then 
uh, once you decide which resources you want, so let's say you want a handful of GPUs, you can allocate them. And you can allocate in Chameleon not just nodes, you can also allocate networks and IP addresses, which IPv4 um, IP addresses are a, <clears throat> a precious commodity, I would say. And while all of us would like if we could come on demand and get those resources on demand, this is not always possible in a relatively small test bed, right? So for example, if you wanted to get GPUs on demand, um, you know, very often you will come to the test bed and you'll find that they're all taken. In this situation, it's very nice to be able to make an advanced reservation. With the GPUs in particular, if you come to the test bed, you know, they might not be available today, might not be available tomorrow, but two days from now, generally speaking, you can find something. To so make an advanced reservation, that resource is available to you when you want it. And you can allocate those resources. You can say, I want a <clears throat> V100, a node with V100 GPUs, um, or you can say, I want that specific node because I'm working on power management and it matters to repeat experiments on a specific node that, that I know about. And then of course you, you configure and interact those nodes. Um, and like I say, it's, it's different, uh, deeply reconfigurable, but we also provide a, a catalog of images that you can use, right? So you don't have to configure them from scratch. And those are, you know, whatever you would expect like CentOS, uh, images. We've got Ubuntu images. We've got images with CUDA for use with GPUs and TensorFlows, right? So we <clears throat> provide and support images with with uh, most popular software. But then, of course, you can add your software on top of those images. Snapshot the whole image. Next time, you just start from that snapshot. We support um, orchestration mechanisms that allow you to take a complex experiment, for example, a, a distributed experiment or or a virtual cluster and package it in such a way that when you want to redeploy it, you can do that with one click. Uh, as I mentioned before, we offer Jupyter integration uh, to allow people to do that in a, in a more imperative fashion. And we also support um, a, a bunch of um, mechanisms to support networking experiments, right? So we support uh, stitching, network stitching, and something called bring your own controller, which allows you to program your own controller on those CORSA switches I was talking about earlier, right? And all of this is um, uh, av available via federated ident identity access. And you can use three types of interfaces to, to access the resources. One is a command line interface, one is a GUI, or, or via integration with Jupyter, right? So that hopefully gives you an idea as, as a Chameleon user what you get once they interface to the system, what shape that system has, right? So now a, a quick tour, a very quick tour of various experiments that people um, ran uh, on, on Chameleon over time. And, and by the way, there's a, there's a paper here where you can learn more of the project. Um, so here's one example uh, of an experiment. Uh, we had a student from a uh, University of Pittsburgh running um, comparisons of uh, high performance computing applications running uh, in virtual machines and versus uh, high performance computing applications running in containers. And she needed to, you know, in order to make, make sure it's apples to apples comparison, she needed to uh, boot from custom kernel, right, uh, change various uh, parameters. Uh, she needed serial console access, ability to snapshot, right, the, the different images in which she was working, and support for relatively large scale experiments, right. So in her case, uh, you can see a graph that went out to, to 64 there, and of course, up to date hardware. Here's another experiment somewhat similar from my colleague at Argonne, Swan Peranu. He was working on an exascale operating system, so inventing a new operating system called Argo. And um, very similar uh, uh, requirements to what you've seen on the previous slide, except he was essentially doing a parameter search over different kernel parameters, right? So he needed to, to boot very quickly and to support this type of experiment, we implemented um, whole disk image boot on Chameleon. Okay, very different type of experimentation now, experimentation with security from um, a small university in the US, University of Arkansas. Uh, they were classifying security attacks. And actually this is a very good example of an experiment that doesn't need bare metal access, right? All they needed was virtual machines at scale, access that they could share with others, and easy to use infrastructure because uh, those, that was a bunch of students. Um, 
another experiment in networking, creating secure networking enclaves. Uh, and for those, for those software defined exchanges, what they needed was being able to allocate VLANs, dynamically allocate VLANs, combine them into wide area networking circuits, right? So layer two uh, isolated circuits, uh, in other words, support for network stitching and managing complex deployment. So what I was talking about earlier, orchestration, right? So in the diagram there, you can see they were managing four different, they were combining four different security enclaves that were widely distributed, right? So uh, that's a very complex deployment. Um, another one, this is actually um, a couple of undergraduate students who won um, award at Supercomputing 17. They, they made it to the semi-finalist stage of the ACM student research competition. A lot of our students participate in those competitions. We're always very proud of the, uh, of the recognition they get. Uh, they were both working on data science projects, right? One of them was uh, working on image extraction. Another one of them was working on, on storage. And they needed, of course, uh, both of them access to distributed storage in various configurations, but also one of them to GPU state-of-the-art GPUs. And again, uh, easy to use um, appliances or easy to use images and orchestration for large scale experiments. This is a very, very interesting experiment from a student at University uh, of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, she was working on adaptive bitrate video streaming, right? And she wanted to, to prove that if you use application level information, uh, which you can use uh, using the P4 switches now, right? You can you can uh, implement your own networking algorithms. Uh, then that improves the uh, the video streaming properties, right? And to do that, she had to create a, a particularly complex experimental environment, which you see in that picture there, of two uh, networking circuits, right? One of them slower, one of them faster, right? And it, it, then she was routing. Uh, the traffic, uh, whichever route was was better, right? So you've got multiple nodes, multiple switches there. Um, there is a little video on on how she did her experiment. So actually, how she did it is more um, important or, or interesting in in what she actually did. Not that that wasn't interesting, but it's just um, it, what, what you know how she did things was a bit of a breakthrough. And then uh, a student from University of Chicago. Uh, made it to a finalist for best paper uh, award at Supercomputing 19. He was working on power management. And finally, a few experiments, a few interesting user experiments that I'm going to uh, stay with for just a little while because uh, they lead us to this expansion into Edge, right? So some of our users are working, doing research on, on biometrics, um, uh, on federated learning, which is when you develop learning algorithms uh, on data that you can't move, typically at the edge, right? So typically at the edge, you've got something like, like biometrics and data that you can't share, but you can use it to train uh, models at the edge, and then later on you combine those models or network traffic fingerprinting for IoT devices, right? So I won't, I won't go into the details of those projects, we don't have enough time, but if you go to our blog at, at uh, chameleoncloud.org, uh, they are all described in this last year, right? In 2021, you can read more about them. And one thing that all these projects have in common is that they use edge computing. Um, and of course, uh, Chameleon at that time did not support edge computing. So they were using Chameleon only for part of their experiments or they were emulating their experiments on Chameleon. But of course, there are limit, limitations to emulation, right? You can, you can reason about certain characteristics, you can't reason about others. There's a limit to how realistic uh, you can make your investigation. And so more and more of our users were coming to us and saying, well, it really would be nice if Chameleon could support edge computing. So, you know, the original idea of that was people just say, can't you just add some Raspberry Pis and some NVIDIA Nanos to the test bed? And of course, that's not so easy, right? As other people would point out, they would point out, well, but those edge devices, those NVIDIA Nanos are typically connected to things like cameras or, or software defined radios or some actuators or, or things like that, right? So it's, you know, they can't be sitting in a data center. Um, and then uh, it, it, their location matters. So again, they can't be sitting in the data center. They are constrained by network connectivity. And those are things we want to reason about. 
right? So, and they are not server class, they don't support IPMI, so you can't do bare metal or configurations, you're gonna have to think about something else, right? And there are many, many other challenges. So out of that, we came up with this vision of a system where you do reconfiguration by a container deployment. So not bare metal, container deployment, but that seems to be enough for most of our users. We provide support for peripherals based on extensible plugin. We can't support all of the peripherals ourselves, but we can uh, make it possible for others to add them easily. And we support mixed ownership, right? So we made available some of those devices ourselves and we uh, support them and operate them ourselves, but we made it also possible for the community to add their own devices. And we made that available at the beginning of uh, last summer, had wonderful uptake uh, from various applications, some of which I'm going to tell you about. Um, but if you want to check out, we've got uh, videos and slides from the workshop uh, that we organized at the end of the summer available. And next week, we should publish the report from that workshop if you're interested on how people experiment with edge devices. Um, and so here's just another picture. We're moving into mixed ownership where we're based on some of the Chameleon devices, some user-owned devices. We provide Chi at Edge, which is the infrastructure that now allows you to allocate and share those devices. And we hope our users will um, invest in projects ranging from, uh, you know, power management to network function, uh, virtualization and intelligent edge algorithms. Um, so just a, a little bit of eye candy of our first efforts as constructing things. We're moving from the data center to uh, little edge devices that were constructed all over the place, literally. Um, and how does that now impact our experimental workflow you know, relative to the workflow you saw on the previous slide, right? So the discovery I would say is very basic right now. For allocation, we do everything that you can do with regular Chameleon resource, right? So you can allocate various different entities. You can make advanced reservation, you can make on demand. And particularly important in the case of edge devices, you can, you can allocate a very specific device, right? Reconfiguration, I already mentioned via container, we do provide catalog of images as before. As before, you can snapshot things. So you can configure your container and then snapshot, save it, right? Then start from that container. And we provide Jupyter orchestration, Jupyter integration, which is particularly important for most of our users. Um, now, in order for users, in order to move to this mixed ownership model, in order for users to add their own devices, we um, had to implement an SDK for Chi at Edge, right? So that allows you to uh, add your own device. But also we had to implement restricted leases. So many of our users say, I want to share a device, but I only want to share it with my collaborators or with my class. And it really doesn't make sense for somebody else to, uh, to share this device because I'm teaching about self-driving cars, those cars are in my lab. And you know, if, if I was to make a reservation on the lab that is somewhere else in the US, I, I can't even see the car, right? So it doesn't make sense. So we implemented those restricted leases as well um, and, and uh, uh, implemented support for peripheral devices. Some of our users are now saying, can you package the whole thing? Which is a little bit forward looking, I would say. All right, so quick look now at a few projects that our users did with Chi at Edge, with Edge Computing in the summer. Right, so first project is the project with self-driving cars. So uh, Rick Anderson, who is the director of Virtual Worlds, Worlds at Rutgers, uh, teaches classes that are based on self-driving cars. You can see in the picture on the bottom, cars drive around the track. The idea is not to drive into those cones or not, not exceed the distance from the track more than that white bar there. Right? Each car is connected to a, a Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi now uh, connects to the camera on the car and the car can see where it's going and to the steering system for the car. And then, uh, you know, there's also throttle, so how, how fast you can control, how fast you can go. Right? That Raspberry Pi or, or NVIDIA Nano more recently is running machine learning algorithms and the, um, the cars are learning about how to drive uh, around the track. And it's a fabulous way of introducing young people 
to the concepts of machine learning, right? So driving those cars, doing, doing races with those cars are fantastic. But logistically, it was very hard for them to, you know, allocate the right device to people, manage the whole thing. So uh, what Chi at Edge gave them is a way to manage, it's exactly what they needed, right? A way to manage the fleet of the edge devices connected to the cars, access through Jupyter Hubs, so student can access those devices, develop, um, you know, their project via Jupyter, uh, consistent network collection, and also a connection to the cloud where they can uh, train their models when they can save the results. And here's roughly what those cars might be doing when they grow up, right? So when they, when they grow up, they might become uh, agricultural robots or drones uh, in precision agriculture. So in particular, in these picture, pictures here, you see a robot, agricultural robot that drives around the field and does phenotyping, which is, which is um, reasoning about plants based on observable characteristics. So wilting leaves, things like that, right? It's got multiple cameras, drives around the field and uh, reasons about the plants. Um, and this project is done by uh, a, a recently a, a announced wireless test bed called ARA. And they have a, a very challenging problem to solve. It's a, it's a test bed which will involve, of course, many communities, uh, which is making rural broadband as affordable, as cost effective as urban broadband, right? So of course, a lot fewer subscribers than rural areas, so things tend to get um, expensive. And they, they adopted Qi at Edge for providing a platform um, for, their, for their community. Um, next project is uh, from Florida International uh, University. Um, they are, there's a group uh, working in marine biology that um, is trying to map existing fish populations, right? Understand better their habitats. So they've got those um, different floating vehicles that you see on the slide on the bottom there. And what they would like to do ideally is follow fish of interest and, and reason about their habitat. Um, and so what they uh, decided to do is put Chi at Edge, uh, Chi at Edge SDK on those floating, on the Raspberry Pis uh, and NVIDIA Nanos in those floating devices. The, the project with us actually uh, evaluating whether that should be Raspberry Pi or NVIDIA Nano, to what extent it makes sense for them to communicate to the cloud, right, for machine learning, uh, as opposed to doing this on the premises. Um, and, and we're working with us on those things, right? So they're both using the Chia Edge devices that we provide, but then they're also uh, putting Chia Edge on their own devices um, and, and using them to drive those vehicles. And last but not least, right, we covered land, we covered water, now it's time for the air. There's this fabulous project called Flynet, uh, which builds architecture and tools that support edge computing devices for scientific workflows, right? And in particular, uh, they're looking at critical applications, which is mapping drone flights. So in the picture on the bottom, you see uh, there's a drone that's trying to uh, get from point A at the, uh, uh, on the left uh, bottom of the picture uh, to point B on the top of the picture there, but there's bad weather coming in, right? And we're trying to map the flight of the drone to avoid the bad weather, right? So it's not going to be a straight line, but you can see that even the curved line, the purple line adjusts, right? So, so your edge devices on that drone are receiving information, uh, are combining that information with, with other information so, so, sources, the information from the sensors and so forth, and, and using it to map out that flight. And they are using, um, using Chi at Edge, uh, of course, for computing experiments, but they also are interested in providing the fruits of their research and, and tools that they can share with the community. So if you think to the previous slide, um, previous slide here, Kevin Boswell is a marine biologist. Um, we're giving them Chi at Edge, that's fantastic uh, because it uh, solves part of a problem for them, but they would prefer not to uh, have to program those tools themselves they prefer to use tools, established tools that somebody else developed that make it easy for them to program those devices, right? So giving them a, a, a Linux prompt is, is not enough, right? They would like uh, some higher level tools. And this project, the Flynet project is, um, they want to share uh, such tools. And this brings us to the topic of sharing, 
right? Sharing tools, sharing the research uh, that you have done, uh, looking at the experiments that some people did on the edge and how to now integrate those experiments in their own research. And that brings us to the topic of, of practical reproducibility. So much has been uh, said about reproducibility in research days. What we're trying to do is solve a very practical problem. And that problem is sort of illustrated by the picture here. Right? So let's say that I'm reading a paper, see an interesting graph. This is, this is literally me reading a paper on my, on my iPad. I want to click on that graph and I want to redo the data analysis or rerun the experiment. Can I do this? Right? So in other words, can experiments be as shareable as papers are today? Because if they can, maybe it makes it easier for me to rerun my performance evaluation alongside their performance evaluation and demonstrate the different trade-offs between what they did and what I did. Or maybe I could start playing with the experiments and come up with a new idea. Or maybe I can give it to my class to, you know, as a homework uh, exercise to uh, redo this experiment from the last supercomputing conference, right? That would be a lot of fun. That could be cool if that was easy to do. Right, so a lot has been said about packaging the experiments uh, in general, but making it practical to reproduce, in other words, cheap to reproduce, has been given a lot less attention. Right, this is what we're trying to do for, for our users. So first of all, what's the baseline? So first thing, and it's a very important thing, is I came to the conclusion that in order for people to cheaply and effectively reproduce each other's experiments, we have to have a public resource that, you know, everybody has access to, right? More or less everybody has access to. So that it's no longer the case that, that I have, uh, you know, a GPU cluster in the, in the basement of my department, but you don't. So you can't reproduce my experiment because you don't have access to that, right? So Chameleon is such an instrument held in common. Sharing by a cloud pattern, right? We're talking about how in a cloud, whether it's bare metal cloud or virtualized cloud or container, you share by deploying an image, right? So just by using the cloud pattern, just by using a cloud and having a snapshotted image, I am making it very easy for somebody to establish my experimental environment, right? And I haven't done anything yet. I'm just using clouds the way they have to be used, right? There's no other way. So that means that clouds or clouds like Chameleon are essentially players for experimental environment, right? So you could have a library of experimental environments like you would have a library of long players. So long as you have a player, you can replay them. Now, what is missing from that? And if you think about it from the perspective of somebody who's reproducing experiments, they would like to have a packaging that is complete, imperative, non-transactional, very important, um, uh, and integrated. And that's goes by the name of literate programming, like Donald Knuth established that, that um, uh, nomenclature. Um, they need to be able to get access for reproducibility to, to the resource, ideally where, where the experiment was performed. And they need to be able to somehow find those relevant experiments. What does that mean from the person who's packaging experiments? So they need to package an experiment that is cost-effective, but also user-friendly, easy to do. Right. I just spent some time with the chairs of, of supercomputing um, evalu artifact evaluation committee, and they were saying that this is really important. You know, we're not going to get many people reviewing things unless they are very easy to uh, to reenact, right? To to evaluate, they need to be able to give access for reproducibility to users, and then of course share work in progress, publish and advertise the work when it's complete. So. We provide kind of three types of things for all those things, right? First, for packaging experiments, uh, we provide Jupyter integration. Uh, then for getting access for reproducibility, um, we provide Chameleon Day Pass. And then finally, we provide Trovi to help users discover uh, experiments and, and share them. So packaging shareable experiments, I already said literate programming is a fantastic paradigm for doing that. And these days, uh, a popular implementation of that literate programming is Jupyter. So we integrated Chameleon with Jupyter, but from the perspective of our users, Jupyter has one very important flaw. 
And that flaw is that when you have those code cells, the, the code in those code cells that gets executed in a Docker container. And users, they don't use Docker containers, right? I mean, some of them do, but generally speaking, they're interested in complex experimental um, configurations as you've seen on one of the previous slides. And so we integrated Chameleon with Jupyter that allows them to create those complex configurations from Jupyter, right? And then run their experiments uh, in that configuration. And you can, uh, you can again see the video of what this looks like with practice. And we do also have a paper about uh, that writes up that, that paradigm. Now, secondly, we would like to have a test bed with Chameleon uh, that, that um, gives you access to resources on which to replay this experiment, right? So you see this paper that I was pointing to earlier, um, and you can click uh, on the graph to reproduce it. it, takes you to a Jupyter notebook where you can now request the day pass. So uh, access to Chameleon for a limited time, specifically for the purposes of reproducibility. And if you go to our YouTube channel, to the Chameleon YouTube channel, you'll see a screencast that uh, it's a four minute screencast that shows you how to use this day pass. Right, so this is this is available in Chameleon now. It's in pilot right now. We're trying to figure out, you know, how people will use it, what else they will want. But I encourage you to use it. And of course, you can embed those links in your own papers. You can provide a QR code on your poster uh, for people to get access to your experiments directly from your paper and and uh, reproduce them directly there. And then finally, uh, you know what the, the question arises: What will the publishing system for experiments look like? How are we going to share them, right? And um, uh, when you think, you, of course, we won't share them exactly like we're sharing papers. But if you think about your traditional library-based uh, publishing and sharing ecosystem, if you were to get something from the library other than book, right, other than paper, something that requires interpretation, as digital artifacts do, uh, you know, for example, a microfilm, the library would probably provide you with a means of reading that microfilm. And I think that a very similar thing will happen for the digital publishing ecosystem. It will rely on, on test beds or infrastructure like Chameleon to replay, reenact the experiments that people are sharing. And so to make good on this, we developed something called Provi. Uh, it's, it's still a work in progress, it gives you bins in, in, like I said, this kind of Google Drive type of abstractions where you can put your data, your Jupyter notebook, uh, links to images on Chameleon, and so on and so forth. You can share it with your uh, collaborators. And as a collaborator, you can come to a portal and browse various different experiments. And we've got quite a few uh, experiments packaged, uh, some of them, uh, some people uh, packaged experiments last summer. Uh, we just recently realized that they have been used hundreds of times, one of them 400 times within the first year after publication. So if you think about it, if you publish a paper that is cited 400 times within the first year, that's a huge success, right? So clearly there's interest. There's interest in replaying your work, in replaying your experiments. You just need to make the entry barrier low enough. And last but not least, Trovi is integrated with Zenodo. So once you are done developing your experiment, you can, with one click, publish it to Zenodo, get a digital object identifier, and that allows you to cite that experiment from your paper, right, to make it better now. All right, so a few parting thoughts. I'm getting slightly in the spending too much time um, um, area here. Uh, one. So a few things I would like you to, to remember from this presentation. One, uh, um, scientific instruments are, are constantly in motion, right? We're sort of, we're lying down pavement as science walks uh, along it. Um, so we're, we're constantly developing it. And in fact, I always say that uh, scientific instrument projects are very often operations projects or, or rather development projects masquerading as operations project, right? Because we're, we're constantly having to create a new thing. Um, what are some of the lessons learned from uh, the, this particular evolution that I described in this talk, right? Going from a, a effectively a cloud test bed 
to a cloud to edge test bed, right? So both a cloud and edge test bed. Um, so first of all is there is an interesting inversion of the notion of a test bed. What we're used to thinking of as a test bed is effectively a pile of hardware, right? And that was what Chameleon was in its first iteration, a pile of hardware, interesting hardware that people can reconfigure at bare metal level. But now our users are telling us, we don't really want hardware. Our edge users in particular, we don't want hardware. We, uh, we have hardware and we have a lot of it because it's very inexpensive. What we want from you is a way to share that hardware effectively and connect that hardware to something like a cloud, right? To a data center effectively. And because there is, I mean, part, part of those edge experiments happen in the edge, happen in the field, part of them very often happen in the data center, right? So, it's, it's interesting, it's no longer a pile of hardware. Pile of hardware is what users have. It's effective ways of sharing that hardware and running experiments on them. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is of course, sharing your research digitally is, is more important than ever, right? We're entering a very new area that invalidates many of those assumptions that we make about uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that is in data center where it's safe, it's physically safe, it's secure, it, uh, you know, it's, it's secure also in a programmatic way, so different data centers uh, implement different policies there, and so on and so forth. This is now completely different. And we can no longer afford for everybody to reinvent the wheel. To move forward as a community efficiently, we need to also share efficiently, right? So it's more important than ever that others can benefit what the research uh, from the research that you're doing, that they can play it, that they can interact with it, that they can get inspired by it to create new ideas of their own. Um, and with that, I would like to leave you with that final last final thought and uh, turn it over to Michaela and see if hopefully somebody has some questions. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. And uh, uh, we we have a 10 minutes that I hope we can spend with chatting with, with you, having a couple of thoughts, sharing uh, our thoughts with you. And I remind our attendee that they can submit their question or your comments uh, through the interface. Uh, one thing that I found extremely exciting in your presentation is this diverse group of projects. And uh, divorce really in all the, the possible meaning meant as that there is different scientific field uh, from uh, oceanographic to uh, uh, aspect of agriculture and precision agriculture. And, uh, uh, but also another part that is amazing is that you are able to engage uh, students, undergraduate students or university that don't have attached a big data center. What is the key for sustaining all this diverse group of projects, the sustainability of Camaleon uh, to address and support this project is amazing. What is the secret? Well, um, so first of all, this is a fantastic question. It's also a question that I probably uh, could, could give a, a separate talk on, uh, but, but let me see if I can pull um, some main themes uh, from, from what you're saying. So first of all, um, just to clarify, Chameleon supports three things, uh, computer science research, computer science education, and emergent applications, right? It does not support production science, right? So if there's the production science where the, where the challenge is in the science, in usually domain science itself, that goes to systems like Exceed in the United States, that goes to the more traditional data centers and, and so on and so forth. So those projects, um, application projects, they are emergent applications. They are trying to figure out how to use cloud computing. Um, they have problems that both inspire uh, computer science research, but also see into computer science research, right? So, so one thing is uh, just limiting the breadth uh, that you were talking about. Um, secondly, sustainability is a very important topic for us, and it's a big, big part of the decision for why we chose to uh, put Chameleon on top of the mainstream open source infrastructure, right? And the key word in there is not necessarily open source infrastructure, but mainstream, right? That means that there is a large community that supports it. 
that means that our support costs go down. And that means also that if we package this infrastructure, and there are, you know, there are many packagings of OpenStack, Red Hat does for different purposes, right? For, um, if we package that infrastructure, and if we do our job right, and, and we try our best, then that makes it easy for others to deploy. And that means also that we don't just package the infrastructure, we also package the operations model, right? So we've got various bots that automatically fix the test bit to keep our costs down, right? We've got a, a library of runbooks, which uh, if you have a problem with the test bit, you can click on it. It brings up the context sensitive runbook uh, that tells the operator what are the possible causes of the problem, what has been tried to fix it, uh, you, know, what, you know, what they should look at, right? So those are things that we can't absolutely automate in, in, in the test bit operations but we can make easier. We invest uh, a lot of um, effort into that. One thing that I would say though, is that to some extent, and, and uh, of course, you know, um, be before, I, before I go for the finish line here, let me just raise another aspect. The sustainability on infrastructure like that goes into hardware, right? So other people could contribute hardware, put in a box on it, so put Chameleon on it and operate it. Like I, like I just said, with the software layer, we're trying to make that very cheap um, because uh, we're building on, on mainstream open source infrastructure. For the hardware layer, uh, let's take the, uh, the case of NCAR, for example. They, this, this is something that emerged um, in the context of um, student cluster competition at this supercomputing, actually they uh, wanted to contribute resources, make it possible for students to experiment on resources. As, as you probably know, student cluster competition needs power information, right? So they really needed bare metal. We made it easy for them to add nodes that they bought for testing uh, to Chameleon. And um, that is kind of, it's, it's, it's a happy arrangement for all parties. Our users get the ARM Thunder nodes, which are bleeding edge ARM nodes. Uh, for NCAR, that leverages investment in infrastructure that they just got for testing, right? It's, it's now useful for more things than testing. So there is the give and take there that uh, gives us hope that others might contribute in the same way. Um, and then now the final thing that I want to say, though, is that um, this is an instrument for research. Is something like that ever going to be commercially uh, available, I posit that it won't be, right? That uh, an instrument for research, the main stakeholder there have to be organization that support and nurture research, right? Because commercial organizations will have their own agenda for, for providing infrastructures. Um, and, and that agenda has, has ultimately much to do with generating revenue, whereas uh, uh, supporting science you know, is, is something that, uh, well, we've got organizations that do that. Indeed, we go back to the business model. Uh, the other yeah. part that is very exciting, and I see also oh. our audience are asking question about is this integration of edge computing and security. And so the question is, uh, how do you assure security with Chameleon? And we go more in the specifics, say, do you rely uh, on building open stack features like security group, uh, or do you place any specialized devices in front of the cloud to prevent malicious attack. Can you comment on the security? Absolutely, and it's, it's a fantastic question and it's also a, a fascinating research area. So as far as um, the edge, edge cloud goes, I, I haven't talked much about implementation because we are still, we, you know, when you, when you build a new system, new instrument, you have, to, um, you have to define what we call product definition. So what the system is going to look like to the users that in itself is a challenge, right? Because it requires understanding the functionality the new instrument has to provide. And then you have to decide on the implementation. Um, for the implementation, we're still tweaking things, but we started out with, uh, with, um, uh, with OpenStack, of course. The OpenStack has this container management implementation called Zoom, and with the requirement to provide connectivity in um, network challenged locations. So what we ended up doing is again, adapting Zoom, so adapting OpenStack, mm -hmm. 
to um, fulfill the security requirements that we had. And we did that by uh, using WireGuard. So, so the, the challenge there is once you take the devices from the data center, in data center, you have a management channel that you can use for all the infrastructure specific things um, that is isolated from the user communication channel that could potentially result in attacks, right? In the wild, you don't have that. But again, we used WireGuard to create those tunnels and then we used VXLAN to switch traffic between uh, the Docker containers that our users use to the user channel only, right? So the, the, uh, the management channel is always isolated from the users um, and, and secured in that way. And I should also point out that another difference with the data center, which, which plays into security is the fact that now you have a network provider, a separate network provider that is different from the resource provider and you have to protect that entity too, right? So the number of entities you have to protect grows, the number of attacks grows. Um, our solution right now, what we're doing is a little bit restrictive for the experiments, right? This is one of the reasons we are playing with the development of the backend still. Kate, I, I, I hate to interrupt you because this is such a fascinating discussion. We are at the end of the time, but I want to share with you to close this presentation, uh, a, a comment from one of our attendees, uh, Queen, who wrote, thank you for a fascinating talk, Dr. Kehi. It feel like we are finally seeing the end result of old proto cloud project like SETI Atom uh, with spare hardware everywhere being repackaged and reused for a diverse range of shared projects. And so I think this is a great testimonial of uh, uh, Camaleon and also a, a way to share with you the excitement of our attendees. Thank you, Kate, for presenting this work. And we will follow up if any of us attending this presentation want to reach out to Kate, uh, we can reach out to her through uh, the webpage of Camaleon. Uh, we have the URL here. Thank you so much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you. And thank you again, Kate. And thank you again for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. Bye, everyone.